And for all of our Theatre Art Life podcast listeners, we have a announcement to make regarding the Theatre Art Life podcast. We are inviting a new podcast co-host to join us on our interviewing adventures around the world, and her name is Kat Landry. She'll be joining us very soon in upcoming podcast recordings, and we're really excited to have her as part of the interview gang. So Kat is a stage manager and a production manager from the United States with a love for many forms of live entertainment. She has experience in theatre, circus, dance, theme parks, cruise ships, concerts, and international mega events. Since completing her work as a production manager on the World Expo in Dubai, she's joined Cirque du Soleil's Allegria Tour and can now be found calling shows under the big top in South Korea and Japan. Kat is passionate about cross-cultural collaboration and being a resource for other young female leaders. She is grateful to have built a career doing her favourite thing in the world all over the world. Kat is a proud graduate of the Carnegie Mellon School of Drama and a certified project management professional. So we're really excited to have Kat join us and stay tuned to hear her on the airwaves. A mantra that I always, you know, try to do my best to live by is watch, listen, learn, assess. They asked me, well, who are you now? And I said, I'm the best leader that I've ever been. If you can create a culture that is true and led by a visionary, the culture is what sustains the company through everything. Hello, and welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast, sponsored by Harlequin Floors, the world leader in floors, stage systems, and studio equipment for the performing arts. Our podcast puts the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the world, the culture creators, the backstage masters. My name is Anna Robb. Today we're talking with Kim Scott. Kim Scott has recently launched her own business, KS Consulting. With over 25 years in the entertainment industry, whether it's on the stage, a professor or the manager of large-scale productions, she has experience in all aspects of live entertainment and production. She leverages her skills in the development and implementation of strategies to enhance performance, operational readiness and efficiencies for theatre companies and universities worldwide. She's committed to being a steward to early career professionals and is a dedicated mentor to young women in the entertainment field. Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you. I can't, I, I, when I got your bio, I was like, well, I can't read out that whole bio because it'll be the entire podcast because you have done so much in your career. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I am getting a bit older. So as you get older, you the, the bios get a little bit longer, but thank you. <laughs> the, list, the list gets longer and longer. So that's good. If we were to sort of, let's start off with that though, because I think obviously throughout your career, you've done many different things, but what would be the highlights or significant points for you in your career that, you, that you're the most proud of or have changed you significantly? Is, is there things in that that you could speak of? You know, when I first landed in Las Vegas, um, I worked for New York, New York Hotel and Casino for a period of time. And just coming out of, you know, my master's program at UC Irvine, being this master's of fine arts uh, candidate and I felt like I wasn't being true to myself as an artist or as a, as a, you know, a caretaker of the arts by working in this hotel casino environment. One of the things I always share when I have the opportunity to speak with students is never, never dismiss those steps along the way. Because when you get along the journey, Everything I needed to learn about managing a large-scale production for Cirque du Soleil was everything I learned working in the hotel casino environment. You know, whether it was working in hotel operations and revenue management and budgets or in human resources, employee conflict, uh, union negotiations, benefits. You know, I finally sat back and, you know, years down the road in my career with Cirque and went, wow. What an incredible springboard that was for me to really get a feel and an understanding for the Las Vegas market because we are so unique and so many of the entertainment shows are connected and and very interwoven with the hotel and casino companies that are here. It was just a great springboard then having that foundation 
to move into Cirque du Soleil and then really be able to understand both sides of the partnership mm. and how that needed to work. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and and what was your sort of transition from that to Cirque? Was that your transition out of the, the hotel business and into into performing arts? And was that your desire or did you fall into it? How did that how did that happen? You know, when I when we arrived in Las Vegas, pay for being an adjunct professor and working at Nevada Ballet Theater and those things wasn't great. And so I, at the time, was going through the newspaper. I'm not sure anyone will know what that is anymore, but I went through the classified ads and there it was, you know, hiring $14.42 an hour to work at the front desk with benefits. And at that time, it was something that I couldn't pass up. So it wasn't out of, uh, I would love to say that I made this conscious decision to, you know, grow my career and my knowledge base. It was really life just stepping in and helping me along the way. And so through that, New York, New York partnered with this company called Cirque du Soleil to bring in this show, Zumanity. So we're going to go back to about 2003. And uh, I was tapped by my vice president of human resources at the time, uh, Bill Sears. He came into my office at the hotel and said, hey, you're one of those entertainment folk, right? And uh, I, I still vividly remember Bill saying this to me. And I said, I, I sure am. And he said, we need help with, with this show and, and these artists and these technicians. And it was a whole nother world for a very corporate, uh, you know, process-driven casino business, which has to be for all the regulations they're under. And then this very cutting edge, way ahead of its time, shows humanity. Think of humanity absence now, but back in 2003. So the audiences were not all ready for it. And in true, the brilliance of Cirque at that time, they were really pushing that envelope. So I had the privilege of being able to go in and do the orientation programs for Zumanity, get the technical training program set up. And I worked with incredible people like Bob McDonald and Nancy Millette, who is still very much an integral part of our, our industry today. And I, I, I learned from them. I understood the language. I understood the need, the time frame. And so uh, Zumanity launched, uh, I had uh, our second son, and I got a phone call from Nancy saying, hey, we'd love to take you out to dinner. Circus going through a major expansion. We are going to be growing three shows a year for the next four years. This was in 2006. And she said, we need someone to get their arms around everything. So keep in mind, my whole background was dance, from being classically trained in the Royal Academy of Dance Ballet then moving into musical theater. So I went to dinner and I'm so excited and everything they want me to do is technical. Everything they want me to put together is the technical safety and health training programs and really write and build the curriculum for CERC. And I, I, I think it's just intrinsic to us as artists, as, as those of us that I believe have a gene that drives us into this uh, incredible industry that we work in in live production and entertainment. And I said, of course I can do that. And I learned a lot. I surrounded myself with incredible people like Tony Gillespie and Jeanette Farmer. And a, a mantra that I always, you know, try to do my best to live by is watch, listen, learn, assess. So when I don't know a situation and I really need to figure things out and better understand how I can be a support to rather than, you know, a top down drive approach. Um, and I use that in how I uh, engaged with some of the top heads of department at the time for Cirque du Soleil. And I remember going to my first rigging class uh, with Tony Gillespie at Ka. Ka had just opened and what an intimidation that was, such an intimidating experience. And he was so incredible. And he said, sit next to me, learn what you can, and I'll help you fill in the blank. And that's what I did. And so I really launched my career with Cirque uh, for the next three years being the training manager and bringing a comprehensive curriculum to all of our safety training, our health training, as well as then some work in the advancement and the management development training and launching the Ascension program. Mm. I mean, it really was the the evolution of 
that kind of genre, I guess, at that time because pre- prior to that, the whole you know, I mean, you know, from Miss Dare and to O and all of those shows, just they were the first time that Casino was bringing in that kind of entertainment, right? Like, and there's actually not that many places in the world outside Vegas, apart from you know its later iterations in Macau. But it's really the the only hub in the world where you've got that kind of casino and entertainment in the same location, right? Right. And part of it is because the sheer cost of these large scale productions at the time, there were very few other companies aside from a Steve Wynn at the time who brought in the original Nouvelle Experience behind uh, Mirage that launched Miss Dare. And then Terry Lanny at, at MGM, who really took over that helm and, and ran with the book, you know, O and then the expansion of, of Humanity and Ka. And so it, it, took companies the size of MGM Resorts International to be that driving force, you know, behind these large scale productions. When we went into Macau, it was with the Sands Corporation under Adelson at the time. And so that was really our first launch into a permanent installed show uh, overseas in Macau. And then, of course, the launch of Zed in downtown Disney of Tokyo. So I always say that I was with Cirque at the best of times and my experience and my knowledge and all the mistakes I made. You know, when I speak to young leaders now, or especially young women, they ask me, well, who are you now? And I said, I'm the best leader that I've ever been because I've taken all of those failures and successes and re-examined them and, and I own them. You know, I don't put blame on a failure or a show that I couldn't manage on anyone else but myself. But then I, I take that. What do I need to do better the next time? And I've learned that, you know, we're, as, as my dear mentor, Jerry Nadell says, we're not curing ALS. We're not curing cancer. We are transporting people for 90 minutes of their life to feel a little bit better, to have a little bit of levity, to experience something in whichever scale of entertainment it may be, whether it's a black box theater down, you know, on um, in the arts district of Las Vegas to, you know, the Ka Theater. Our job is to create this this journey for people. And so I think I've learned over the years, I need to give myself a little bit of a break and not take things so seriously. That would be my advice to my younger self if I could have... Uh, you know, send a time capsule. <laughs> I would, I would probably concur the same. <laughs> I when when you, if you were to say when you when you left Cirque du Soleil, I, obviously there's a million lessons you learnt. But what was your biggest takeaway from your time with Cirque? I really realized what I was capable of. And again, while I was there, I, I had some incredible mentors at the time. I had the opportunity to go through the first sale of Cirque and working really hand in hand with Jerry and Callum and and that team and understanding that was my first real understanding of what it took in this massive company that we were, that we were managing and moving into the second. And and I won't go into where I think the failures happened on the, the, the hand over there. But uh, what I learned is that it's still about the people and If you can create a culture that is true and led by a visionary, the culture is what sustains a company through everything. The hard times, the good times, the what are we doing here times, if you have that strong leadership at your helm, you do these 20-hour days like you're doing right now because you have a vision, you have a passion, and you know that your leadership at the end of this the people still matter. And if you lose that, if you lose sight on that, the people around you are what are the driving force to your 7 and 9.30 every night, and you just see them as a line item on your P&L that you can continue to cut to make your, your EBITDA margins, then you've already failed as a company. It's just a matter of time before the end is inevitable. And so when I left Cirque, I took on Celestia. It was that joint production with Brian Burke down at the Strat and some of the America's Got Talent uh, team, an incredible company that we worked with there. And we were just turning things as COVID hit. That was the first show where I was really able to 
impact and affect the changes that I wanted to see in bringing in women of our BIPOC community and underrepresented voices at the table into live entertainment and into management positions. So when I had left that show, all of my top leadership for from my company manager to my production manager, my GSM were all women, all people that identified as women. And it was the first time that I really felt like I had a, a put up or shut up. Right. I do a lot of lecturing and this is what I say. So this was finally my opportunity to, to make that change and to make that impact. And now at Enchant Christmas, where I'm currently the vice president of operations, still working and having an incredible COO like Jerry and Adele, I am given that opportunity to really mentor, grow, cultivate and do a far reaching search for those those underrepresented people that want to be a part of our industry, but just don't know how yet. And how can we help them identify their transferable skills that can work in entertainment? And what we need on this side from a business perspective, from a human resource perspective. And so it's, it's been a lot of lessons learned, but I'm enjoying the journey so far. That's amazing. And now a moment for our sponsor. The Theatre Art Life podcast is proud to be sponsored by Harlequin. Harlequin is the world leader in floors, stage systems and studio equipment for the performing arts. Established in the UK over 40 years ago, Harlequin is the preferred performance floor for the world's most prestigious dance and performing arts companies, theatres and schools. From the Royal Opera House to the Bolshoi Theatre, the New York City Ballet to the Royal New Zealand Ballet. Harlequin's experience and reputation are founded on the development, manufacture and supply of a range of high-quality sprung and vinyl floors specifically designed for dance and the performing arts. Backed by an engineering team and independent research, Harlequin also designs, builds and refurbishes stages working with stage engineers and theatre consultants in leading venues across the world. Harlequin is the global leader in its field with offices in Europe, the Americas and Asia-Pacific. Find out more at harlequinfloors.com, H-A-R-L-E-Q-U-I-N floors.com. It's interesting when I think about that because a lot of people I have spoken to struggle with building that roadmap to that kind of inclusivity. What's your formula for making that a reality in your world? I wish I had a formula because I would give it to everyone. And then we wouldn't, we wouldn't struggle with the same uh, challenges that we have. I do as much education in the middle school and high school level that I can. So I, as, as many times as people want me to come and speak to their students or do a podcast or, or a Zoom call with their students, I, I do my best to educate all, everyone that is interested in entertainment as well as the parents, the caregiver side of this equation, because still there is a stigma that those of us that work in entertainment, you know, we're baristas during the day and and, uh, doing our shows at night. And I believe at a time there was, but I I still very much credit Guy uh, Le Liberté for making that transition to where his artists and technicians and team could, could, have a life working for and not needing to supplement, uh, you know, in addition to. So I do my best to educate. I do my best to speak wherever I can. I work a lot with USITT, the United States Institute of Theater Technology. Um, I would like to say that we have it figured out, but, but we struggle as well. And part of it is just education and exposure to the arts to those areas or demographics that may not have it as readily available to them or have people that are making a conscious choice to expose them to to the arts. I grew up on a farm town in Nebraska and my parents made a commitment to drive me an hour and a half one way to receive my dance instruction, to receive my training in Omaha. So there I was exposed to the arts and people and culture and and everything that we're working for today. So these podcasts are great because they're far reaching and they're accessible. And I hope that some, some young person out there hears that and, oh, I, I'm on a farm and it doesn't mean that I'm precluded from being a part of, you know, this live production 
the themeth that we call entertainment. Well, I took my daughter to some Cirque shows recently and now I'm driving her to uh, gymnastics class once a week because she wants to be It's fantastic. I love it. I love it. And I always encourage who, who's ever responsible, you know, make that commitment. Make that mm. commitment. Uh, you never know where it could lead. Mm. For those who are our international listeners, can you explain what USITT is and, 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 and how that works in the U.S.? Sure. So USITT, we actually do have a presence uh, overseas. We do have members uh, from Germany as well as England and, and you name it. So USITT is an organization and really our mission is based in the education and the development and the improvement of the live entertainment industry from professionals to academic to students, all aspects that touch the industry. And we work to provide not only year-long uh, learning opportunities through our online programming, but our national conference each year, where we take a week to come together. Uh, we have an incredible uh, set, uh, list of sessions and speakers and different topics from, you know, rigging to wardrobe to makeup for our BIPOC community and, and how to be a, a responsible steward of our industry, as well as then we have a massive trade show floor of different vendors and uh, product providers to assist in, you know, your creation of live entertainment, big and small. And so uh, USITT.org is the website there. Lots of great information. One of the things that I'm most proud of there is the backstage exam. And that backstage exam is really geared at high school students to take this exam to really understand the basis for launching then into a college program. Or maybe if college isn't for you, you at least have a standard understanding of working safely and effectively in a theater environment. You may just want to hit the road and, you know, and start pushing boxes and mopping stages and, uh, you know, doing all those things. I'll never forget when I had done a tour at CA for one of our uh, high schools and colleges that was coming through and it was preset and they saw the technicians mopping the stages and one of the students said even Cirque technicians mop stages so I don't know if they thought maybe we used you know like iRobot Roombas but no it's important that you know that these students understand this is a part of the industry and the preparation of so that was a really funny moment for me when I when they realize that even the, the biggest shows in the world still mop stages. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Everybody has to be prepared to do it if that's how you put a show on. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I think it's pretty, uh, it's also, it's interesting time because the industry is changing so fast right now in many ways in, in what kind of entertainment is working in what kind of technology is being used and all of this. I think for, you know, I, I think I look back and it was very simple when I entered the industry as far as I'm concerned. I think there's a lot to take in now. How do you think that the youth of today can be prepared for, for this kind of industry and, and how rock and roll it is? Wow. That is one of the, the really critical points that Enchant Christmas is at right now because during the shutdown, so many of our talented technicians left the industry because we were deemed, at least in the United States, unessential. Uh, my husband working for the city as an industrial electrician, he worked nonstop. But for those of us in this business, we were shuttered for over a year. And so many, many of my colleagues who had families to, to support and bills to pay moved out of the entertainment industry and went into you know, transferable jobs and skill sets like a Carpenter with the city of Las Vegas or moving back towards family to help care, you know, for, for older loved ones. So I think our industry right now is twofold. Uh, we are hurting, as we all know, finding those qualified technicians that are readily available. We, we do have a technician shortage and we're all feeling the crunch across the board from you know, solo tech to Enchant Christmas to, to Cirque to Dragon, everybody's trying to find that top talent. Students today need to focus on what's not in the curriculum and doing a little OT. 
And that's not overtime. That's their own time. So many academic programs are restricted by the curriculum that has been approved by their university and being able to hit those marks and this many credits and this gives you this diploma that programs that haven't transitioned more on the, I would even say the sports entertainment, you know, mega production side are no longer servicing that technician, that student is not coming out of those programs with a viable knowledge to work at, I want to say, kind of that top level. There will always be a need for these theaters, uh, the more traditional theaters that uh, are roadhouses that can be supported by those students. But I, I go back to the professors and to those setting that curriculum to be a bit more challenging and to think, to think more out of the box bringing in outside companies. Every time I call the company to do a, you know, a session for the UNLV EED program, they were more than willing to do it. So get a hold of, you know, the Meyer sounds that are out there, get a hold of Elation Lighting that's out there, get a hold of Solo Tech and ask them, you know, to come in and, and, and do a workshop with your students. So I understand the financial restrictions those universities are under, but then supplement that. And for students, seek those out. You know, one of the great things that did happen during the pandemic is many of these courses for these companies went online. If you look at ETC's website right now, they have a listing of online courses, and the majority of them uh, were, were free, were open for anyone just to come learn and, and to understand. So I would encourage students to do a little OT work. What what don't you know? What is not being done in your program? And then get an internship and get your hands get your hands dirty. And like you said, even if it isn't your you know, if you go back to your early experience in the casino, even if it's not particularly in the exact avenue in which you want to be, end up in, ultimately, it is a step and can be a step. And any any aspect that you learn of the industry is in your toolkit. You know, as you move forward. I, I always find that, that no matter what you do, you're learning, right? So as long as you're in the industry doing something, then you're, you you start to build that toolkit in. And it does take time to be, because it, the facets of our industry is so diverse, you know, all of the different lighting and sound and scenic and costume and then the performing side of it and then the different genres of performance. This It's not, it's such a, it's so much to learn. Like you, you, you it does take time to acquire skills to be, of the, that high level, right, in, in the industry. It's not something that you just walk out of a college education and ready for it. It takes time. <laughs> right. And I think those expectations need to be managed with students understanding that that four-year degree was, well, check mark step one. And I, I absolutely value those. Would I, if I could tell my younger self to get a master's of fine arts, Probably not, because what I knew in entertainment, uh, I had lived it on, on really being on the stage for the first half of my life. I would have done a master, an MBA, a master's of business administration, because that whole other level that you just talked about, technical and artistic, then has to be managed. So from our finance teams to our people and culture teams to the company management team, there's a whole other side of business administration that we need. And we often struggle sourcing that as well, because I'm not sure we have done a good job in this industry of reaching out to those finance people that graduate, you know, with their finance degrees, uh, that we need them too. And what an incredibly, you know, magical place this is to work in entertainment. So I think we need to be better about uh, reaching out to other uh, disciplines and showing them the brilliance of entertainment and and the opportunities that it can lead to for them. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, we did a lot of webinars over the pandemic and one of the reoccurring themes that, that came out a lot with many of the people that we spoke of or to is that they did their degree, but they were not taught enough about the business of what they were doing and essentially when you leave and you become a freelancer you are your own business and if you've never been taught the tools and the uh, the kit 
in how to manage yourself, let alone manage a production, let alone manage all of those aspects of it. It is a big gap, isn't it, really? And 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 it it needs to be really focused on because I also uh, look for a lot of people in in my work who are of that management level, and it's it's can can be hard to find, you know, that combination of quality management and financial management with an understanding of the arts is is a very niche uh, role and and much wanted. It is, and it's, yeah, completely. And if a university could carve out some of the history of lighting, you know, and, and take out some of those courses, and I understand the why those professors are tenured, uh, that knowledge is important. But then the one thing that I have pushed with USITT over the years and our director of training and development has done are ensure that the courses at the conference are filling those gaps from what's not being taught at the university level. Unfortunately, a one-day session and you know, in, in our conversation isn't enough. So if a university could figure out how to and or what I would encourage students to do, you know, major in your your theater, your entertainment theater program, minor in business, because that is that that secondary part to everything that we do. Even when you're a head of carpentry for the Beatles love, I'm, you know, I'm still going to you for your budget analysis. You're still putting in POs. You're still bidding out, you know, products and, and what we need and meeting with vendors and having those conversations. So there is still very much a business side to everything that we do. And, and I don't think we've been great in stewarding that and mentoring those students coming up and those early career professionals that, to your point, there's a whole business side to this. Mm. No, it's super interesting. If I was to pivot a little bit about Vegas specifically, I mean, post-pandemic, how is, what, what's your view of the current state of entertainment in, in, in Vegas right now? How, how is that going? I think we're going, it's an ebb and flow, right? I just watched the great uh, movie Elvis, you know, the new uh, movie that came out. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Ah, phenomenal. Love it. it? Incredible. The musical theater side of me, right? I I will always connect with that. We, in my opinion, we're, we're, the pendulum has swung back to the headliner area, era. So the days of Elvis, you know, um, at the International we're now seeing Adele, Celine Dion, Usher, uh, you know, Luke Bryant. We're seeing Lady Gaga, these headline artists that can pull $1,000 a ticket. We're seeing the onset of sports entertainment in Las Vegas with the Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Raiders, soon to be, you know, something else, you know, the... Um, the rumors of the uh, Oakland A's coming to to have a stadium here in Vegas. So when you have someone that's paying a hundred dollars to park at the Raiders Stadium, a couple of thousand dollars for tickets, you're going to be in a couple of hundred dollars for a few cocktails and hot dogs while you're at the game. You're not dropping another eighty to a hundred dollars to go see a show. And so, um, or with Lady Gaga or Usher. And so all of those big headliners are, are taking precedent. I do still think that there's a market for uh, those, those production shows that are currently here. I think that you're going to have to be and have the word of mouth with uh, something like an absence that is that very cutting edge, uh, different very eclectic to a sit-down proscenium, watch a show type theater. I do hope the pendulum swings back. I, I believe that there is room for all of the arts in our world. And those shows give everyone an opportunity to have an incredible time when they come to our market. But I do think the pendulum has swung now back to these headliners and to sports entertainment, which was never uh, a competition in 2006 when we were selling billion dollars worth of tickets a year, we didn't have that competition. And now everyone in Vegas has the competition. Yeah, it's really interesting. But it also could be an opportunity. I mean, if you're going to make sports entertainment and raise the bar, 
Vegas is the place to do it, right? If you want to lean more into the entertainment facet of what's possible in a sports stadium entertainment-wise, uh, go with it, right? <laughs> right. And I really think the Vegas Golden Knights, yeah, the Golden Knights did that. They were in Vegas. They went big. They have the, you know, the shield that comes down and, and uh, the pyrotechnics and the lights and I've seen now other, you know, hockey teams starting to try to add a little bit of juice to their opening ceremony. But when in Vegas, there is an expectation. Uh, there is an expectation of performance. There's also an expectation of, you know, the days of the 399 buffet are over. Uh, I remember coming to Las Vegas. Um, actually, I was performing here in a, in a competition, and it was the dunes. And I remember going with my parents. It was four ninety nine dinner buffet, you know, and and a mile long dessert bar. And those days are over, you know. That food, when we made the transition from the Wet and Wild on the Strip and the MGM Adventure Park, and we really focused on food and beverage, that culinary experience with the Gordon Ramsays, the Giadas, the Wolfgang Pucks, all of that went away. And so Vegas is very much, if you're not creating that ultimate experience for the price point you're charging, you're not going to last long anymore. There's too much competition. It's such a fascinating sort of island of, of, of action in, in Vegas specifically when it comes to entertainment, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. So we always ask these last two questions of our podcast guests. And so I'm going to ask these of you. What's your what's your most favorite part about your job or the industry that uh, that you're in? It's this. It's being able to share. As I always say, my job is to share the potholes that I stepped in and, <laughs> and drove in and in the hopes that the next generation doesn't and they learn just something from this message so that their their path can be a bit easier a bit more streamlined and that they continue to pay it forward that they share that knowledge that they continue to be open uh, that's one of the things I love about our industry is we are a very collaborative industry when it comes to putting a show on we dig in we open up we put in the hours and we make it we make it happen and I, I'm not sure there's another industry like us out there. And we, we are drawn to it for that reason. So these types of opportunities to, to share that insight is what I find so valuable for, for us to continue to be, you know, the leaders in, in what we do. That's an amazing answer. And if there was one thing about the job or the, the industry that you would change, what would that be? We're still working on pay parity for some of our departments. We're still uh, working on having a clear reflection of skill and compensation. Um, that the industry, to your point, we took off like a juggernaut in technology. And so the shows and the companies were not able to keep up necessarily on that hourly rate or salary rate that was that was fitting of kind of this cutting edge technology. So I still think that we have work to do in, in pay parity in those departments. Uh, we have work to do in recognizing the contributions of all people in our industry and ensuring that we reflect those of us creating this magic we are a reflection of our audiences receiving it and um, ensuring that we are, you know, we're opening that door to that next generation behind us. That's amazing. Kim, thank you so much for your time on the podcast today. It's really been good to see you and to chat to you about your work and your life uh, over there in Vegas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Theatre at Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only $38 US per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com. <laughs>